Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. And today, continuing on with me going back through old Booker Prize shortlists, I wanted to look at 1994. Um, so a good 30 years ago now, and it's sort of interesting to see where these lists have gone, how, how some of these authors are really well respected in some ways or have somewhat fallen out of popularity or, or what have you. Um, so with that in mind, let's get talking about this. I'm going to start with the winner and go through the shortlist as we go. Um, and yeah, let's get going from there. I'm joined by the Golden Girls um, here. Um, and yeah, let's let's get started. So starting with a little bit of background context for this year, in 1994, this was quite a controversial year for some reasons, partly because of the winner, which I'll go on to in just a second, but also because we have five men um, and one woman. And I'll talk about the, the one woman um, as we get to her book. Unfortunately, it's the only one I actually don't have a copy of with me here, either from the library or physical that I already own. Um, but uh, we'll get talking about it regardless. But this was an, a time where this happened a lot with shortlists. This is not particularly long after the, the period that led to the Women's Prize being set up because there were so few women. Um, there was a shortlist basically where no women were on it and that led to the creation of the Women's Prize. And so in some ways this is a bit of a precursor um, as well. But let's get talking about that as we go. So let's start with the winner. Um, and the winner was James Kelman with How Late It Was, How Late. And like I mentioned, this was a controversial winner for several reasons. Firstly, because in many ways it's very different from a lot of other books that have preceded it. It's written almost entirely in a very strong accent. It's written with this strong Glaswegian um, twang to it throughout. And what that means is that it feels quite um, unsettling almost as a reader in a way that I think is a real positive but um, and clearly some of the judges agreed but there was one judge who basically wrote a letter afterwards saying that she thought the whole thing was puerile and if this won this was a you know a stain on the the name of the Booker Prize and a big part of that was because also this book contains a lot of swearing and it's kind of impossible to capture certain dialects or certain um, ways of speaking without capturing how people actually speak, which is also to include lots of swearing and, and what have you as well. And actually, I think all of that really is misleading about what this book is about, because, you know, if you think about books like Train Spotting or or this book, indeed, the being able to write from a strong uh, accent or strong dialect is a really important piece of writing. It's a really strong way of showing the the internal thoughts of a character you know not every character speaks with received pronunciation um and it's important to be able to to mirror that but i think what people really took objection to with this and with train spotting and various other things was because it was so different that it felt alienating um i remember at uni this being a conversation in a seminar where someone said well actually equally the language of something like um I don't know, Jane Austen, for example, is also something that many people in different parts of the UK might not be able to um, understand in the same way or that, that it, it speaks to a different type of um, speech that, that not everybody has or uses. Anyway, all of this is to, to sort of preamp, do, act as preamble to this book, which I think is much more interesting than all the discussion that was happening around the dialect usage. I think that obscures some some really fascinating parts of this. So what we're really focused on in this book is a young man whose life is slowly falling apart. We're watching as uh, things are sort of spiralling around him. Uh, he is due at the police station. He knows that various things are coming to haunt him and his past is catching up with him. And so what we're seeing is his almost sort of final days of freedom to some degree of him articulating what's been happening in his life. And there's a really great tradition of so many books and writers that do things like this fantastically. And I think this book does some really beautiful things with it. I think we are able to see this really haunted picture of a man who is, or rather a picture of a haunted man, I guess, um, in that he is watching everything around him fall apart. There are various things about um, drugs and alcohol, around not having enough money to pay for things, about crime, about various other things just going wrong in his life. And all of that comes towards this sum total where we don't 
excuse him for his behaviour, but we start to see the world that he lives in means that there's an internal logic to a lot of what was happening for him. And so I think this is a really interesting book. I, I maybe wouldn't necessarily have it as my winner from this list, but I think it's so distinctive um, that I can see why it won. Something that I noticed when I read back over all the old Booker winners is even when you do get a book like this that doesn't fit the, the mould, as it were, of all of the other winners, um, the dynamism and explosiveness of a, of a book like this shows why it would have stood out in a shortlist and particularly how it would have got to the point of winning. Um, and with a judging panel of five, you only really need three judges who are willing to bat for a book. And so if you're distinctive enough, that can happen. And that's what happened here with a few other people on the panel perhaps not liking that very much. Um, so I think this is a really interesting winner. Not necessarily the one I would pick, and I, I, I wonder if time has been both kinder and less kind to it. I think kinder in the sense that it was such a big, dramatic, controversial win at the time um, because it seemed like it wasn't quote-unquote proper literature um, in the same way that these other books might may well be seen as. But I think it does something really distinctive that now belongs as part of a canon of other books that do similar things. So um, being able to look at a book like Shuggy Bane, which goes on and wins much later, a very different story but set in sort of similar-ish circumstances at times and still very heavily using bits of dialect where where needed and and things like train spotting and all of these other things I, other books and pieces of media i think allow this book more of a space but i think as a result this book for me as as impactful as it was um i maybe don't love it as much as i maybe would love something like shaggy bane or what have you i still think this is a really solid book um, and i think it gets easily maligned by uh, in comparison to many other winners. Keeping up a kind of bawdy chatter within um, within the book itself, this next book, uh, Reef by Ramesh Gunasakira, is a really interesting one, I think. It's a set, it's set aside uh, uh, aboard a boat, and essentially lots of things are happening just out of the vision of our main character. So he is a cook on this ship and he's watching various things happen. Um, and he doesn't initially understand what's going on. You know, somebody will change their tune slightly and or maybe act slightly differently. Somebody will disappear for a while. Somebody will seemingly be very enamoured with somebody else and the main character is not particularly sure what's changed. And as much as we're seeing things largely through his eyes, we're also able to go that step beyond to kind of start reading behind the li between the lines of what's happening here and often there's a lot more moving um, in this and this being a 20th uh, I think 20th anniversary edition there's a foreword in this by the author where he talks about this and his intention was to write a book where you know a short slim volume of a book this is about 150 pages or so I think something like that 180 um but a book in which multiple readings would start to reveal some of what was really happening. And so we are on the shoulder of the narrator for most of this book, kind of wanting to jump in there and say, hey, buddy, actually, I think you'll find it's this. And what follows is this quite quietly haunting story of all these happenings aboard the boat, where we realise a lot more is happening behind the scenes, sometimes with more tragedy, sometimes with more levity, often with more tragedy. Um, and we can start to unpick what is really going on here. And I, I thought this book was really interesting for that, the way that it approaches this degree of innocence through the main character's eyes. And we know that not only for him personally as a as a person, but there's a sort of geopolitical thing happening as well. We we know that many of the changes that are happening are global politics to some degree. And he is this innocent, naive figure who we're watching this through and knowing that he is not fully able to understand what's happening, but in many ways is also wiser than some of the other characters. So I thought this was a, a really refreshing book um, and really interesting in terms of how it's constructed, I think, as well. Next up, another book with a very naive young man at the heart of it, um, and again with global geopolitics affecting many things, and that is Paradise by Abdul Razak Gurna, who was also recently, I think 2021, the Nobel Prize winner. So another thing of, it's interesting watching, going through old Booker Prizes to see where some of these big name authors, um, who then go on to win bigger prizes later down the line, kind of cut their teeth in terms of prizes. 
And Paradise is about a young man who, from quite a young age, his basically his father uh, loses a lot of money in various bits of gambling and, and sort of playing various games. And he finds himself having to go and work for this mysterious man he's never met before, who's sort of an uncle figure. And he goes to work with him, not really understanding what is happening. And he is then, as a result, placed in the middle again of some of these geopolitics going on. He's suddenly a young man in a new place. He's the, the naive one from a small area, sort of small town, trying to now exist in a bigger city. And this is all in um, a kind of a small, well, I think, I'm not sure if the country's ever explicitly mentioned. I think it's meant to be, uh, it's an East African nation. I, I'm not fully sure how often it gets mentioned, actually. Um, but what comes a, a, what becomes apparent from that is where those intersections of cultural things come in. So there are many traditions around religion that he is not that familiar with. And so he's essentially plucked out of his previous life and forced to exist in this other world. And he immediately is around a set of characters who ha who kind of just get the world much more than he does. They understand things around money and service. And there he is working in some kind of service job. He um, doesn't understand things about love and relationships. And suddenly there is um, an older woman who frequents this, uh, I think it's a cafe, um, and just keeps on appearing and is incredibly uh, enamoured with him, shall we say. Um, and so this whole thing spills into this really fascinating conversation and really com uh, fascinating story of a young man trying to grow up in the world, but in a world that's been radically changed. And again, a world where he is on the back foot trying to understand the world through their eyes. And this theme of innocence comes through a lot in not only this book, but this shortlist as a whole. I think um, the way this character has to try to understand the world is fascinating and I, I really enjoyed the depiction of it. Next up we have Alan Hollinghurst with The Folding Star, um, a book that I really love and also very recently got signed by the man himself which was a lovely thing. It was when I went to go um, to his signing to talk about the, uh, when he was talking about the book Our Evenings um, so I brought along the only copy of a book I own of his uh, to get it signed which was lovely. Um, but The Folding Star is uh, Another story of love and to some degree innocence, although it takes on a different uh, a different theme to some of the rest of the books on this shortlist. Um, essentially, a, a man, he is sort of in this strange period of his life. He's not quite sure what he wants to do. And he ends up in this relationship with this young man. And what we then start to see is this kind of demimond existing of the quiet unseen spaces of gay life and sort of gay subculture. So we have these various moments where we are seeing in the changing rooms or the locker rooms sort of style uh, places that these men are hanging out. But also this book is a meditation on art and love and many other things. Particularly in terms of art, we focus on a Belgian painter. Um, is it a Belgian painter? Yes. Um, and it's it seems like that shouldn't work. There's something about this that I found very compelling, the way that Alan Hollinghurst is able to draw these parallels between art and this other world and what have you. And although many of these characters operate in this world that is um, upper class or more sophisticated or whatever, you know, there's a, a kind of exclusiveness, exclusivity to this world um, that other characters don't have. And, that's compounded by some of the aspects of, of homosexuality within the book. I think there's also something just so fun and sexy and joyous about this. Alan Hollinghurst is such a brilliant writer of uh, men's inner lives and particularly gay men's inner lives. And the way he's able to capture the character's thoughts um, and actions around sex, around love, around intimacy, I think is so well observed. There's something so precise about the way he's able to spot the nuances of how men operate in worlds that are almost entirely men, like this shortlist, <laughs> um, and uh, the ways that men are able to uh, have very, very different lives when it's a, an all-male space, or how they are able to shed other things in their lives and feel be able to be more vulnerable in certain spaces when that's the case. So I think this is a 
you know, this was, I think, I want to say it was Alan Hollinghurst's first and only other time being shortlisted before he then went on to win with the line of beauty. And you can see already that the kind of bubbling sociopolitical commentary on class, on love and sex and so many other things. Um, and in the talk that I saw Alan Hollinghurst at, he mentioned how, particularly in some of his earlier books, he wanted to up the the, the amount of sex um, in the book, in, in those books, partly because this was a time where a lot of these were being stripped away, where people were told that you couldn't write some of these things. So he kind of thought, sod it, let's go all out. And it, it shows in books like this that have these really intense sex scenes, but also that always seem to serve the plot. There's always something going on in the background about the character's emotional state or mental state um, that is played into with sex and, and relationships and various other things. So I thought this was beautiful. I just absolutely loved how this book is able to portray that. And next we have George McKay Brown with Beside the Ocean of Time. Um, and this is gorgeous. I thought this was such a stunning book. Um, if any book is going to sum up the innocence of this shortlist, it's probably this one. Um, we have a young man who is, um, he has, is, uh, was it Odin? Thorfinn Ragnarsson. He's got this really very, you know, um, almost mythical tale style voice. And he's a young boy in, um, in a, on a small island in Scotland, in Orkney. Um, and he is fascinated by all of these tales of victory and heroism and and war and battle and all of these sorts of things. And he daydreams his way through his childhood. So he's in school, everyone is saying, ah, oh, he's so lazy, he never listens in class. Um, his dad is publicly embarrassed by the fact that his young boy doesn't want to take up what everyone else is doing and do these big macho tasks of helping out around um, around the island, you know, cutting up firewood, making things, doing all of these things, because instead Thorfinn is off, sat on a log somewhere, daydreaming about these giant battles. And we see these daydreams in the book, and we have these really elaborate stories of war and battle and he's often a figure in those as well, of sailing out to sea for months on end and coming back um, you know, victorious, carrying his treasure and all of these sorts of things, um, which is really compelling and really interesting in its own right. But the book does this really beautiful um, 180 almost on it of taking that idea and applying it to what he looks like as an adult. And as an adult, we find out that he has been to war. Um, so his childhood heroism, you know, these thoughts of being this big, Viking-like character fighting in, you know, fight, sailing the seven seas and having battles and conquests and whatever. He instead is this young man who comes back and is somewhat traumatised by the experience. He has been in a prisoner of war camp. He is um, just slightly unnerved by everything that's happened. But what he finds out when he's in this prisoner of war camp is that he really loves to write and he turns these elaborate daydreams that help him get through the harsh reality of um, being in this, this camp. He applies that to these really elaborate stories and this gets the attention of um, the prison guards who want to make an exception for him to be able to write out his stories and have them sent to the UK so that they can be published. And so he, he emerges, re returns back to this island as an older man, looking back at his life and still being filled with this wonder of what things could be happened, but now tempered with an adult's knowledge and an adult's pain and trauma. And it's just such a beautifully done book. I It's, it's really short. I think it's about two, yeah, under 200 pages. And there's, it's so incredibly vivid and powerful. And I don't know how he does it in this. Because even 30, 40 pages in, I was completely blown away by the the joy that comes through this elaborate storytelling from him. Um, I think it's a really beautiful story, and particularly that sense of innocence being challenged by everything else that's going on around him. I, I think it's such a, a beautiful piece of writing. Last but not least, we have Jill Patton Walsh with Knowledge of Angels. Uh, and this is somehow the only woman on the shortlist, um, which seems really strange now. It's been so long since we've had a shortlist um, like this. You know, this year we had 
2024, we had the, the inverse where we had, you know, five women and one man on a shortlist. So it's interesting looking back and seeing these old shortlists where there were so few women. Um, and this book, I think, is really stunning in many ways. Another very short book, but one that contains a lot within its pages. This is in many ways still concerned with innocence and experience uh, in, in that sense, but particularly around religion. So this book operates with a sort of philosophical idea throughout about the power of, I suppose, gospel or of of a religious text, uh, religious rules and, and credo. And so it starts with essentially the, the, the challenge that's being made to the word of God existing on an island um, and what that looks like when it's challenged. And so early on we have, an, have it established in the book that this is an island where very much there are rules that we follow um, and there are things that are just truths and this is what this island is like and this is what we must all believe. But very quickly these things start to be challenged, partly by people who are new to the island or have new ideas, but partly also by some of the circumstances, which mean that the characters start to examine what the world looks like just outside their usual ken. And I found it fascinating I mean, firstly, this is beautifully written anyway, but I found it so fascinating the way that this book is able to exist almost as a philosophical treatise whilst being an incredibly readable novel. And so I found it deeply beautiful and, passion uh, and, and passionate in it, the way it, it talks about things. It's a book that I don't think ever fully... It, it talks about religion and it challenges this idea that um, that there's one singular truth. But it, it does so in a way that feels relatively careful and sensitive. It doesn't feel like an all-out attack of, you know, religion bad, other thing good. It feels instead like it's a critique on the ways that it's very easy for a small island or a small group of people to be made to think the same way. And that that sense of tall poppy syndrome is a scary thing that if anybody were to try to challenge the the kind of the, the orthodoxy of the island, that's a problem. And so this book, I think, is really interesting for the way it approaches this. And I, I thought this was so beautifully done. Um, Language-wise, it's so clever and so good. It has this medieval feeling to it. It's a very strange book in some ways because it feels like it's hundreds of years ago, but it has a freshness to it. Even though, you know, this book is now 30 years old, um, I think it still reads incredibly brilliantly. Um, it doesn't feel like it's been dated in terms of the arguments it's making. So I thought this was just really, really beautiful, um, really, really clever book. Um, and although it's ultimately not the happiest <laughs> book, uh, it still really, uh, really took, yeah, re really sort of took me by the hand and, and, um, and I, I really appreciated the way this book did what it did. I think it's a it's a really great addition to this list. So as you can see, um, this short list of six has quite a lot of overlap um, in a way that, you know, it happens a lot with short lists that there's some kind of overlapping theme. We saw it in 2024 with a lot of books that had this really open, quiet space to them that were a lot about grief and loss. And in many ways, that's reflective of a lot of what was happening for the the judges this year and um, it seems that it seems like there was a lot going on there um and so it's interesting that a year like this is so full of books about small locations you know small islands um or some degree gated off communities you know in um how late it was how late we've got this sense of not being able to escape the place that you're in we've got um, you know, besides the ocean of time that deals with uh, Orkney in a small island, we've got knowledge of angels that is around a small island. We've got um, paradise and reef that involve being moved from one location to another where you are somewhat isolated. Um, and in both cases, these are places that are not fully able to leave or can only do so with some difficulty. And so these books all, all taken together, I think, are so interesting as a as an insight into what was maybe happening 
at the time that meant that so many writers were writing about this. But equally, the the judges really felt a love or an affinity with the themes that were going on here. Um, really fascinating that so many of these books converge around this theme of an an innocent, typically young, in, innocent man who is trying to understand the world around him. Um, and that really appealed to the judges as well. But it's also so funny for me that in a year where you've got so many books about this kind of these quiet innocent young men trying to escape things and and feeling somewhat trapped that the winner is a really bullshit <laughs> kind of man who is like swearing left right and center he still in many ways fits the 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 mold of many of these other characters he's still a man who's somewhat lost and is trying to find his way in a world that feels hostile and with rules that he doesn't understand or rules that he does understand but can't really escape and so it's so funny that of all of these very quiet, very minimalist books about um, about this, that the the bolshy, loud um, book full of swearing is the one that wins, and also that one of the judges then is so annoyed that the sweary book wins that she uh, threatens to quit basically. <laughs> um, and so there you have it. We've got this really interesting shortlist. I think if I were to personally pick a winner, and this is obviously with 30 years of hindsight, you know, these books have, uh, you know, that so there's been so much space since these books. I would personally have, I think, uh, Knowledge of Angels, I think is a, a really brilliant book and I would love to have seen that win. Uh, Beside the Ocean of Time by George McKay Brown. I think this is such a gorgeous piece of writing in, in so, so many ways. Um, and of course, you know, my man Alan Hollinghurst, um, who I adore, I would love to have seen this win. But really, this is a shortlist that before I went into it, I was a bit more nervous because I knew practically none of the books apart from knowing of Alan Hollinghurst um, and having read one or two other books of his and um, and knowing that this was the big controversial winner and taking them as a group all together and particularly the uh, three of them, I, I, the ones I've got from the library I've read more recently all together, the others have been a bit more spread out. It's been so fascinating to me that um, such interesting quiet books are ones that I, I'd never really heard of and yet these are the the books that have gone on to um, to really Im impress me. And this is the joy, I think, of going and reading old shortlists, is these are books I probably would not have heard of or picked up otherwise. And I'm so glad I did, um, particularly something like Knowledge of Angels, um, which I just think is a, a really quiet piece of beauty. And you know, besides the ocean of time, that's just so stunning in the way it's written. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you've read any of these. Um, it's really fun looking back at this just because of how much controversy was there for a book like How Late It Was, How Late. And now, I, I don't know if this would even register in some people's thoughts. You know, a couple of years ago, I think it was maybe 2019, 2020, we had Gabrielle Krauser with Who They Was, which was in many ways in a similar vein, you know, talking about um, gang life and told almost entirely in this really intense uh, dialect. It's a really close focus with very little described outside of it. If you don't understand what's happening, you you don't have any other access to what's going on. And I find it so interesting that a book like that was semi-controversial, but here we have a book that did that much, much earlier and really, sort of, in many ways, paved the way for slightly more experimental or alternative books to win. And I say alternative in a, in a really, this in many ways shouldn't be alternative to have the voices of local dialects or local ways of speaking, but it's interesting to see a book like this triumph and cause so much acrimony um, among people who don't see it as proper literature. So anyway, that's been this list. Um, I hope you are doing really well. Um, I'd love to hear if you've read any of these books or other books by these authors. Uh, take care and speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.